You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. Today we're recording for the first time in sunny Santa Monica, California. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Deanna Lee. Every Friday we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's June 28th. Tens of thousands of people die on American roads every year. Sometimes it's the result of a drunk driver or someone nodding off behind the wheel. Or maybe a driver looks down to read a text message or decides to speed through a city neighborhood. Clearly, at least some of these tragedies could be prevented. But what if it were possible to prevent all of them? What if we could bring the death toll down to zero? According to Rand Research, we can. We could go without a single death on American roads by the year 2050, if we transform how we think about road safety, invest in innovative technologies such as autonomous vehicles, and stop accepting car crashes as car accidents. First, let's talk about how vehicles and roads are designed. Imagine if they were made for bad drivers rather than good ones. For example, at a four-way stop, it takes one mistake, one missed sign, for one car to slam into the side of another, the kind of T-bone crash that causes nearly half of all moving car-to-car road fatalities. If you put a traffic circle at that intersection instead, you might see more sideswipe crashes, but you would prevent the more serious T-bone accidents. Second, there's technology and innovation. By 2050, some vehicles may be completely autonomous, with no driver required. But there are less flashy innovations that could be pursued now that would be real lifesavers too. Automatic emergency brakes, lane departure warnings, and other driver backup systems could save 10,000 lives a year and cars that sample the air for alcohol on a driver's breath could save at least 7,000 more. Third, and finally, getting down to zero fatalities will require a society-wide change of attitude, says RAND expert Lisa Ekela. She compares it to smoking. It wasn't one big policy change that removed cigarettes from airplanes and restaurants. It was an evolution in both law and public opinion. If dangerous and distracted driving were as socially unacceptable as smoking in public, we may begin to see real change. We'll leave you with an image that Ekla and her colleagues envisioned you might see if this kind of culture of safety takes hold. Imagine you're driving down the road and you see a billboard. It's like one of those signs they have at construction sites. Welcome to our city, it says, where we haven't had a fatal crash in 27 days. Historically, America's vast power, combined with the weakness of most of its enemies, has allowed the U.S. to get away with a striking absence of deliberative judgment when deciding on war. That's according to Rand's Michael Mazar. But today, the potential stakes of entering into a war of choice, for example, with Iran, are greater than ever. If the U.S. were to tumble into a fight with Iran, what would it look like? What would be the U.S. objective? Can military force achieve that objective? How would Iran react? How long might a war with Iran last, and what would it cost? Would China or Russia get involved? It's difficult to identify anyone who's asking these questions, says Mazar. He's spent a decade researching U.S. deliberations around the country's last war of choice, Iraq, and warns that ongoing debates about escalation with Iran could lead to history repeating itself. Fortunately, there are a range of options to change America's approach to wars of choice. More powerful offices within the executive branch could confront presidents and cabinets with truly tough assessments of potential wars. Congress could be more decisive in asserting its war-making powers, and the media could better fulfill its obligation by undertaking rigorous investigative analysis of potential military conflicts. Here's how Mazar sums it up. Quote, It is time to rethink how America makes the decision to embrace wars of choice before it's too late. One in five people in the U.S. have a mental health problem, but less than half of them receive treatment. To get help for more people, California launched an unprecedented social marketing campaign focused on reducing the stigma around mental health issues. This campaign, which began in 2013, is the most comprehensive mental illness stigma and discrimination reduction campaign ever conducted in the U.S. A new RAND study suggests that such efforts hold promise. We surveyed around 2,000 California adults, all of whom had previously reported symptoms, suggesting that they probably had a mental health problem. 
According to the results, the campaign appears to have led more people to seek care for their symptoms of mental distress. Notably, this effect doesn't seem to have been the result of stigma reduction, which was the primary goal of the campaign. Instead, it appears that the marketing effort was successful in increasing awareness of mental health issues. This is the first evidence that a social marketing effort like this may be useful for increasing the percentage of people with signs of mental illness who obtain treatment. But the study's authors cautioned that they could not rule out the possibility that those who sought treatment simply were more likely to notice and recall the campaign. And similar results might not be observed in an environment that is less supportive to those with mental health challenges than California is. The U.S. is entering a period of intensifying strategic competition, most notably with Russia and China. This contest is expected to play out below the threshold of armed conflict in what is often called the gray zone between peace and war. How should Washington respond? A new RAND report finds that the most important principle to keep in mind is to not merely try to mitigate losses in the gray zone. U.S. leaders should also seek to gain a strategic advantage. The authors offer eight other principles to help guide the U.S. gray zone response. These include being proactive rather than reactive, developing the ability to respond quickly to provocations, and aligning with local partners as much as possible. Economic sanctions have been the centerpiece of U.S. efforts to liberate Venezuela from Nicolas Maduro's rule. But according to Rand's James Dobbins, it's difficult to, quote, starve out leadership when the leaders are the last to go hungry. This strategy, consistent with the maximum pressure approach that the Trump administration has used with Iran and North Korea, has not been effective, he says. And if it becomes evident that Maduro is not about to fall, U.S. officials should consider repealing the sanctions that weigh most heavily on the Venezuelan people. Meanwhile, the administration could continue to target and isolate the Maduro regime. There are new questions about the viability of China's one-country, two-systems policy. Despite ongoing unrest in Hong Kong, as well as fierce resistance in Taiwan, Chinese President Xi Jinping remains committed to implementing the policy on strict terms. According to Rand's Derek Grossman, a future battleground for this policy may be the Taiwan-administered island of Kinmen, also known as Kimoi. Kinmen does not subscribe to one country, two systems currently, but it tends to align more with China than with Taiwan. And it recently accepted support from Beijing in building new infrastructure. The future of Kinmen is unknown, But as of now, the region of Macau remains the lone success story for one country, two systems. Grossman says this is likely because in Macau, China's policy is left completely unchallenged. When it comes to Western involvement, Grossman says that the U.S. and the West as a whole should keep a wary eye on Chinese activities within this arrangement and work together with the people of Hong Kong to rein in Beijing's excesses. Western leaders should also further support Taiwan's decision to reject one country, two systems. And if Taiwan's position were to change, the West should ensure it is a freely made decision, one uninhibited by Chinese coercion. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We're off next week for the holiday, but we'll be back in your feed on July 12th. See you then.